Hello, everyone. Welcome back to BungaCast. I'm Alex Hokely. I'm here with Phil and George, as usual. Um, they did. I, I don't know why I got a last name and they didn't. But you're all patrons. You guys know who we are by now, surely. So, um, but it's just good to reaffirm one's own identity, um, which actually is sort of like what we're talking about today. Uh, we're talking about liberal nationalism. This is another three articles uh, in which we each bring a piece to discuss uh, around a certain theme. And this one is uh, kind of three different pieces, one from The Guardian, one from Compact, and one from Unheard, uh, discussing or proposing in different ways uh, a return to liberal nationalism or a liberal argument for nationalism. Uh, anyway, how's it going, you guys? Good. How are you? Yeah, it's going well. I'm looking forward to discussing this, these, these three. As a, as a liberal nationalist yourself? Well, I wouldn't say Post-lib- liberal, surely gammon nationalist now. Gammon, yeah, gammon nationalism, gammonism. <laughs> I would accept that. It has actually been really hot as we have to talk about the, the weather. Um, and yeah, that has led to some some boiled gammons, as we all know. Are you a boiled gammon, George? Mm-mm, not not no not at this point in time what you got to do is get your bin get your bin out take everything out and fill it up with water and just go sit inside your bin outside i was sympathetic to the guy being videoed there he was just yeah. in his bin trying to fucking chill out and everyone and some guy turns up about... filming him in his car and be like what are you doing he's like i'm just in my bin fuck off yeah, and this just is a great living video. that bin life yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah it is kind of what makes britain great so it is. It's kind of like what makes it crap, but also great at the same time. It is. I, I guess every country has its own like self appreciation of its like crap greatness. Um, so, <laughs> and in, but they, they, it's in different ways, you know, in different places. Um, anyway, um, again, we're, we're 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 circling around the theme of uh, of patriotism. Um, so let's get actually Indeed. started. Um, my one, um, I'm starting this off, is a piece in The Guardian by Lucy Powell called As We Unite for the Jubilee, Let's Believe Britain's Best Days Are Ahead, Not Behind. Now, just a little bit of background. Uh, Lucy Powell is a British Labour MP. She's at Shadow Secretary of State for Digital Culture, Media and Sport. Uh, and interestingly, uh, was elected in a by-election, uh, which is when a sitting MP stands down, uh, on the lowest ever turnout, I think, of of, 20, of 18%, which is kind of remarkable. Um, she is really, truly the people's representative. Um, a couple of other little facts about Lucy Powell, which I wasn't aware of. Um, in 2015, one of the most farcical moments in British politics happened when Ed Miliband, uh, who was leader of the opposition, leader of the Labour Party at the time, <laughs> revealed the Ed Stone. You guys remember this, right? Ed Stone? <laughs> Um, one of the greatest moments, yeah. It's one of the greatest moments, yeah, um, where Ed Miliband inscribed his political pledges in a big fucking stone. It was like a really big stone. It was like a Stonehenge kind of stone, maybe a bit smaller and probably, um, you know, synthetic materials. But uh, anyway, it, <laughs> this was to show, of course, how serious he was. Um And funnily enough, Lucy Powell said, and she was on air saying this, I don't think anyone is suggesting that the fact that he's carved them into stone means that he's absolutely not going to break them or anything like that, (laughs) which of course completely undermined the message that these were uh, promises which were set in stone, which could not be broken. Um, anyway, fantastic stuff. Anyway, she, she's also uh, uh, was a campaigner for Britain in Europe, you know, for uh, Britain to vote uh, against leaving the EU, as well as a member of Labour Friends of Israel. Which again, I'm just I'm just highlighting these things because it suggests potentially an ambiguous relationship towards uh, the nation and nationalism. Um, anyway, so uh, in in this article, I'm not going to describe it all for you. Let's just say it's a dog's dinner of uh, well, yeah. And, and by the way, a dog's dinner is a British idiom for a big ugly mess. If you're not familiar, it, it's interesting because Powell feels compelled to throw in all her you know, generally kind of milk toast, liberal mainstream political prejudices into this container of patriotism. So it's a little bit of everything and everything is potentially patriotism. And her uh, primary claim, I guess, is that labor is the home, the true home of patriotism and not the Tories who are now irresponsible populists. So labor incorporates and is the home of values like diplomacy, rule of law, decency and integrity, uh, as well as tolerance, openness and generosity, which are core British values. And labor, of course, uh, represents them. And of course, the, the concrete embodiment of this is things like our NHS, the Premier League, the BBC. <laughs> um, but, 
and it'd just be easy to laugh at this because it's so lightweight. But I guess what is interesting um, is that there is an attempt to incorporate sort of national populist talking points into sort of Blairite balderdash, you know, just kind of floaty, yeah. airy, third way nonsense. That was um, a good word, balderdash, Alex. Is, you've not it, entirely like you've not entirely removed yourself from your British your British roots. Great. A great but, phrase, Blairite Balderdash. It's Look great, right? I, I mean, it, almost, it was just almost the, the, worthy of Boris himself. The the alliteration suggested itself, and um, you know, you can you have to go with alliteration if it's there. Um, anyway, so there is, in, in terms of uh, you know, national populist talking points, she talks probably the only concrete sort of thing that is proposed there, suggestive of what Labour might do or wants to do, is this buy, make and sell British, effectively reshoring a lot of production, making sure that, uh, you know, you have food and energy security and uh, whatever. And this is obviously uh, propelled by COVID and uh, the Ukraine war. And she puts this explicitly. Um, but I guess anyway, I mean, just to round this out, um, it is obviously a, an attempt to respond to uh, yeah, to I guess the sort of populist moment, um, but it but without really breaking from again the sort of Blairite shell. So I think the perfect example she said, we want to defend and protect our values, but move with the times and keep Britain at the cutting edge of innovation. A little bit of everything, um, but it does it does suggest uh, that at least the kind of yeah the quote unquote liberal elite is trying to turn to patriotism or at least speak in its terms as a way of re-legitimizing their project. Yeah. No, I think that's well, <clears throat> that's well put. I mean, the, and I think I would agree with your general characterization that the actual content of the article is, is fairly flimsy. I don't have anything as good as Blairite Balderdash. I wouldn't even try to match that. But the, the argument is essentially that Labour is the party of patriotism because Brits like rules and the Prime Minister broke rules while Keir Starmer is Mr. Rules. And <laughs> the nation yeah. is composed of values, climate investment and the NHS. That's like, that's those, that's it. That triangulation between those three in the middle of them, bang, that's Britain. Um, yeah. And there's no political content to the nation here. It's all Joe Cox, not Oliver Cromwell sort of thing. So it's, I mean, and this is a very, you know, it's quite, it's limited, but revealingly limited because there are certain things which, you know, she's not obviously not going to, going to attempt to, to make, to, to bring into that, uh, nation that labor can represent but um it's all very there's still things which basically everybody agrees with like or or that's her would be presumably her intention is to be like this isn't the nation which is mostly pretty good and it's all fine and it's all like nice values about rule of law and and being decent and queuing and talking about the weather and all that sort of shit not that even that for ages. i mean it's so unspecific not even those kinds of you know, truisms about British behaviour are even mentioned. I guess, I mean, I don't know if there's much to add, really. I think your read is right, Alex. It's, um, on the one hand, it's something which could have been published, you know, without a few, with a few kind of changes. It's the kind of content could have been published any time since, you know, 1994, basically. But in the context in which it's being published at the moment, it's clearly, like you say, kind of a bid to capture a certain mantle. And so... I suppose what it tells us is that they are, and this comes out more also in the other two pieces we're going to discuss, but they are trying to carve out a political identity to respond to an era of post-globalization. Hey there, you've reached the end of a short excerpt from an episode that's been released only to our patrons. If you'd like to join us and gain access to around two Patreon-exclusive episodes a month, please go to patreon.com slash We'd love to have you.